Hi guys. Firstly, I want to give you all a disclaimer uh, that I just tried really hard uh, to not underline anything in this book because I like to keep a book clean. But I I I only like to keep a book clean, but I'm, I never succeed in that. Uh, so uh, in the beginning portions of this book, I didn't underline much. Uh, the first part that i really uh, started underlining was from the third chapter because uh, these are the portions that i remember i want to remember forever and that i want them to be stamped in my head so here hear out this portion the third chapter is called uh, seeds that were to sprout uh, and this paragraph that i'm about to read ends with a very strong statement from his friend ram swarup his college senior and also his friend philosopher guide for the rest of his life goel writes four years after leaving college i was ready to join the communist party of india when it declared war on the newly born republic of india in february 1948 i conveyed my decision to my friend ram swarup whom i had met after leaving college and who was to exercise a decisive influence on my intellectual evolution he wrote back immediately you are too intelligent not to become a communist but you are also too intelligent to remain one for long contemplate on that because that is the upanishad way of learning you read and you contemplate and you execute this was a prophecy which came true goel writes it was only a year and a few months later that i renounced marxism as an inadequate philosophy realized that the communist party of india was a fifth column for the adv- advancement of russian imperialism in india and denounced the soviet union under stalin as a vast slave empire before i tell the story of that transformation i have to look back and point towards planting of some other seeds in mind these seeds were to sprout into life as soon as the spell of marxism was broken and grow into an abiding faith in sanatana dharma the first college teacher to leave a lasting impression on my intellectual growth was our professor of sanskrit this great language and literature was not my main subject in ba honors i was only supposed to qualify in it in a supplementary examination and then forget all about it the prescribed course was the first four chapters of the dasa dasa kumara charit of dandin and a few cantos of the kiratar junium kiratar junium of bharavi with some grammar and translation work thrown in as an aid in the normal course therefore a casual student like me should not have attracted any notice from our sanskrit professor nor he from me but we were fated as it were to fascinate one another the outcome of this meeting was not not only my lasting love for sanskrit language and literature but several other decisive departures in my way of looking at hindu philosophy and history this professor had spent several years in europe to earn his phd he had also taught at shanti niketan for some time but these were only his outer accomplishments which several other professors also had in their own fields what mattered most to me about him was his vast erudition erudition in the wide fields of traditional indian philosophy indian history and indian languages and literatures every single line of prose and poetry in the prescribed texts was for him an occasion to launch launch on a, lear- a learned discourse in comparative linguistics metaphysics history and what not his contempt for modern indologists was always as obvious as his admiration admiration for everything which was traditionally hindu he stalled me one day when he poured undisguised contempt on sir s radhakrishnan who in his opinion had tried to fit hindu philosophy into the straight jacket of a conceptual framework borrowed from western philosophy i had not studied any hindu philosophy so far nor had i read any writings of radhakrishnan but this was a famous name in which every indian was supposed to take legitimate pride the professor clinched the argument by stating that i had bracketed this portion clinched the argument by stating that a man venturing to write on hindu philosophy without a knowledge of sanskrit was like a man writing a check without a bank balance so obviously that's very embarrassing for everyone who loves and claims to love indic philosophy or indian uh, texts 
because most of us don't know sanskrit <laughs> we have we have read either hindi bengali or english translations of these books or tamil telugu i was to discover later on that the professor was more than right in his indictment and goel uh, harps on our wound another day he came down very heavily on the theory of an aryan invasion of india in the second millennium bc i had never suspected that this theory was a deliberate plant by western indologists to prove that india was a caravanserai which no racial religious or linguistic group in india could claim as its original home uh, maybe some of you don't know the meaning of caravanserai uh, it's the word sarai that uh, we have in india in in every languages which is why we have a place called sarai ghat and we have a train called sarai ghat express sarai means a traveler's resting place sort of a motel or i n n inn in english so uh, his professor is saying uh, aryan invasion theory was planted in indian in indian education system uh, to prove that india was a caravanserai just a temporary resting place where no racial religious or linguistic group in india could claim as its original home our teachers of history in school and college had always started their first lessons in indian history with the advent of the wild aryans who destroyed in destroyed the cities in the indian in the indus valley who drove the dravidians towards the south and whose warlike ballads were preserved in the rigveda the professor dismissed all this history as a cock and bull story for which there was no evidence literary or archaeological it was a strong influence of our sanskrit professor which made me stand up in protest when our history teacher traced the bhakti movement in medieval india to the influence of islam it was revolting to hear him quoting dr tarachand approvingly while he taught that shankaracharya was drawn towards monotheism due to his association with some arab merchants who had settled down in kerala towards the end of the 7th century ad the history teacher challenged me to write a rival thesis disproving what tarachand had propounded i wrote a rather long paper on the bhakti movement which took me an hour to read before a full class the history teacher praised me for arguing my case very ably from my own premises but he was adamant that a well known authority like tarachand could not be wrong <laughs>